Let's take a moment to consider a very interesting microbe, Bacillus subtilis, labeled the subtle Bacillus some years back by a microbiologist. Microbiologists discovered this microbe almost 200 years ago and thought of it as a soil microbe because it's found in abundant quantities in soil, especially around the roots of plants. And so it's likely that humans acquired it by consuming roots and tubers. And it has been since shown that Bacillus subtilis is a normal inhabitant of the human gastrointestinal tract. Well, I first became acquainted with Bacillus subtilis because I was looking for microbes that have two characteristics that they either colonize, or in this case, germinate in the small intestine and produce bactericins, natural peptide antibiotics that kill off mostly fecal microbial species. So if you've been following my conversation, you know that I'm very concerned about the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, SIBO that I believe has now affected over half the U.S. population because of a variety of reasons, such as the overexposure to antibiotics, processed foods containing preservatives and emulsifying agents, many other factors. But this has allowed fecal microbes to overproliferate in the colon because we've lost beneficial species that were suppressing them. So there's overproliferation of fecal microbes in the colon which then ascend into 24 feet of small intestine. This is a very destructive process. Those fecal microbes colonize into 24 feet of small intestine are very inflammatory to the largely unprotected small intestine. And the small intestine is naturally very permeable because that's where we absorb nutrients. But when you have fecal microbes colonizing the small intestine, it increases its permeability and that opens the door for the entry of bacterial breakdown products, especially something called endotoxin, into the bloodstream. And that is why microbes in the gastrointestinal tract, especially as SIBO, can be experienced in the brain as sleep disruption, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. It can be experienced in the skin as a variety of different skin rashes like rosacea or psoriasis. It can be experienced in joints and muscle as fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis. It, it can be experienced as autoimmune diseases. It can be experienced as metabolic distortions such as higher blood glucose, type two diabetes and prediabetes. It can be experienced in the heart as atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, impaired contraction of the main pumping chamber, left ventricle and as coronary disease, especially coronary plaque rupture, the process that leads to heart attack, sudden cardiac death. In other words, SIBO and endotoxemia explains so much what we didn't know or were uncertain about in human health. So I asked this question some time back. Well, what if you went to the store, to the health food store, and got a commercial probiotic off the shelf and took it? Would this SIBO 30 feet total of fecal microbes in the small intestine and the colon, would that commercial probiotic get rid of it? No, highly unlikely. It might suppress some of the symptoms like bloating, <clears throat> but it will not make that process go away. So here's a, another set of questions. What if we chose microbes that, yes, survive stomach acid and bile and are known to, to adhere to the intestinal epithelium in the small intestine, or at least germinate there as, as in spore forming microbes, and produce bactericin. So I chose three in my original recipe for what I called SIBO yogurt. I kind of regret calling it SIBO yogurt because it made people think that it was only good for treating SIBO. It's not, it's actually a collection of keystone or foundational microbes that helps you rebuild a healthy gastrointestinal microbiome, but I called it SIBO yogurt just to drive home the point that it might be useful for SIBO. So I chose three originally in the, in the original formulation, a strain of Lactobacillus rotari, a strain of Lactobacillus gasseri. Both survive at high counts. We've known this for decades. Even Dr. Gerhard Reuter himself showed that rotari and gasseri survive stomach acid and bile. One of the studies he did, a very exhaustive study, by the way, in the late 1990s, was to have participants swallow a capsule that was motorized to open in the ileum 
and grab some of the contents of the ileum and then have it expelled and studied. And lo and behold, loaded with rotarine gas, right? As well as if you run a stool test, if you've been taking rotarite, because remember, most people have lost rotarite. The vast majority of Americans have lost rotarite because of its susceptibility to common antibiotics. But if you took rotarite and then did a stool test, you'll find rotarite at high count. So we, we know it survives. We also know that rotarine gasteri have expressed what are called adhesin proteins that allows them to adhere to the small intestinal wall. We want that, right? And we know they produce bactericins. Rotarite produces typically two, rotarin and rotocycline, and gasteri produce typically three or four. Now, the original formulation, I picked a third microbe, Bacillus coagulans, which is a very interesting microbe. Uh, because it also produces bactericins, it's been shown to have such effects as reducing muscle injury during strenuous work or exercise. So I think it could be a real advantage to athletes. But we ran multiple assays to see how many counts we get. With rotoroid gastro, we get super duper high counts, typically about 300 billion per half cup serving if fermented by themselves. With coagulants, we get wild variation, typically low numbers, rarely more than 10 billion in that half cup serving. So I replaced bacillus coagulants. It doesn't mean bacillus coagulants is not interesting. It just means that dairy may not be the best vehicle to provide the nutrients necessary for that species to proliferate to high numbers. So I switched it out for bacillus subtilis, much easier to ferment. You can ferment it, by the way, at 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit about 34, 35 Celsius for 24 hours, not the usual 36 hours we've been using for lactobacillus species because bacillus subtilis is a rapid fermenter and you don't need more than 24 hours. That's very easy. I've not had any failures with the bacillus subtilis, but the magic of bacillus subtilis is that it does not colonize the small intestine, but it germinates in the small intestine where it forms a biofilm. It's very good at forming a biofilm that is a mucus-like layer that allows it to sequester itself and protect itself and take up longer-term residence, presumptively for greater benefits long-term. So think about this. We've got a couple of bactericins being produced by lactobacillus rotori, three or four typically, depending on strain, of lactobacillus gasteri, and we've run DNA sequencing on the Bacillus subtilis, and uh, the strain that we've been playing with has seven bactericins. So it's a powerhouse of bactericin production. It also produces something called surfactant. And what that is, is while it makes its own biofilm, it also disrupts the biofilms of other microbes, such as pathogens and, and candida, by the way. So the combination, rotori, gasteri, subtilis, I think is an extremely potent combination, especially if you have SIBO and you need to push back those invading fecal microbes and thereby reducing endotoxemia and its effects that are body-wide on every organ of the body. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please see my super gut book. See my WilliamDavesMD.com blog where the recipe for SIBO yogurt is there as well as in the book. Uh, if you need support, I invite you to join my conversations in my inner circle drdavesinfinitehealth.com where we talk about this and we keep you updated on all the new ideas. So I introduced this recipe, the, the new recipe in that inner circle and showed people how to make the yogurt. So that's your way of engaging and acquiring support as these ideas evolve.